so yeah, next we'll have um, Young Yun, um, sorry, uh, discuss machine learning and AI methods for metabolic learning uh, modeling and reactive transport um, models. And I know there's a lot of anticipation for this talk, so I'm really excited. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Um, so uh, Tim's talk and also Koi's uh, tutorial session really sets up nicely my talk. And Tim already mentioned that uh, I'll be uh, presenting the user of machine learning technique as a tool for developing reduced auto model to accelerate the computational speed in coupling with reactive transport model. So this figure right there is the, the gives the idea that what I'm going to talk and what is my focus in my talk today. So again, uh, this is overview and then highlight a shaded area represented that I'm, this is a area that I'm going to cover in this talk. So I'll talk about how to utilize the genome skeletal model uh, developed from meta genomes using KBase and then uh, running this model, FVA model, and generate data. And those generate data will be used to, to train machine learning model, in this case, neural net model. This neural net model will be used as a reduced order by Jokepler model for the coupling with the reactive transport model for one day column simulation as an example. So I'm not specifically using the people term for that coupling because this is what our COE covered, but I still will be talking about the coupling with 1D column that using the code generated by MATLAB myself. Okay, so I'll start with the motivation why I, I prepared this talk and also give a brief overview and reminder what is FVA and DFVA. Although I talked about this uh, yesterday, but I'll give a little more detailed perspective on those uh, uh, methods and then uh, talk about the existing ideas using lookup table for coupling with reactive transport model, direct coupling versus indirect coupling. These two methods came from uh, Tim Scheib's group and then one of them was led by uh, Elin Feng. And then I talk about machine learning techniques for like a new tool for reduced auto modeling and then I'll give specific examples of how to develop this sort of model for BGC model, like biogeochemical model, also reactive transport model. So I think this is a grand challenge in uh, subsurface biogeochemical research, as well as like more broadly, like environmental science ecosystem modeling. We want to build a, a molecular level understanding of biogeochemical function. And then here, Bottom left is metagenomic data, meta transcriptomic, proteomic, metabolic data, really great source for building molecular level understanding. However, there's a gap. I mean, so the BGC model, like so called black box model, currently used is not really ideal tool to incorporate this. So there's a question mark here. Well, even though I know that there are very innovative ideas to incorporate or use this omics data for building a uh, lump to BTC model though, but I still think genome scale metabolic network model is more ideal tool and the more effective tool to incorporate this uh, autonomous data. But the value of uh, meta genome scale network model is more than that actually. We can use them, these models to identify new biogeochemical creation that have not been known before, but very critically important. And also we can use this model to design experiments to validate these new findings and predictions. And I think particularly it'll be useful for studying the carbon speciation, because if you know the current status of lump the BGC model, they are really focused on mostly the nitrogen cycle, but the level of resolution for carbon speciation, very, very simple. So therefore, there's a room uh, potential that this uh, genome scale model or detailed model can contribute to reveal uh, new new reactions and carbon speciation. And equally important, I think, for uh, studying and modeling coupled carbon and nitrogen transformation because the metabolic data model con combines all elemental species there, not only carbon and nitrogen, but phosphorus and sulfur and everything through metabolic pathway that this pathway is already mass balanced and charge balanced and energy balanced. Therefore, you can look at those pathways and see how energy, those key elemental compositions are coupled together through the metabolic pathways. 
And but there is one small problem we have in using this uh, genome scale metabolic network model for reactive transport model. So this is a running FVA one time. It's not just uh, not a matter because it just runs like a second scale. However, if you combine this model with reactive transport model, like large scale, local scale, eventually global scale, this is really a heavy computationally heavy process. Therefore, that's, that's the motivation of this talk. I want to talk about how machine learning technique can be, uh, can be helping reduce computational burden and facilitating this integration. So um, please allow me to use or uh, recycle some of the features I have used yesterday. I hope you understand at the same time that it's not easy for me to make four talks over three days in a row. I know the team is making several talks as well. Uh, but anyway, this is challenging to me. So, but the reason I recycle this video is not because of uh, saving time, but because of relevance. I think this is one of the simplest toy networks I can use for explaining different concepts of model without changing much. Anyway, as a reminder, this is toy network. We have uh, extracellular metabolized S substrate and B biomass and P, P product. And then we have intracellular metabolite M1 to M4. And FOVA assumes steady state for entire reactions, entire compounds, like including in, intracellular as well as extracellular. And then the bottom there is a mass balance equations for intracellular reaction. And conveniently, we can represent them as a vector um, n dot r equals zero is a vector uh, matrix representation. And then FVA performs linear programming to maximize, to identify or predict the flux distribution within this network by maximizing biomass production, R5 in this case. But yesterday, Jeneka and Chris and me clarified that any function fluxes or their combination can be chosen as objective function. Uh, so this is just an example. I mean, we can, you can think about different types of objective function, of course. And, but here, in case we want to determine flux distribution, when we maximize biomass production, we have to constrain one of the reaction there, otherwise the solution becomes infinite. Therefore, most frequently people constrain uptake rate of substrate, R1 in this case. So then linear programming is formulated like this, maximization of biomass in this case, R5, such that, so we have an equality constraints, NR equals zero, bottom there, and also constraint, inequality constraint, R1 can change from zero to one. One is just an example. Under this constraint, we can solve, solve linear program problem. I know the solution in this simple case. The pathway that will optimize or maximize the biomass production will be just along this straight line. This is so R1, R3, R5 should be one and all other fluxes should be zero. This is clear. Now I talk about DFVA, dynamic FVA is a little bit different. First of all, DFVA assumes steady state only for intracellular reactions, that is M1 to M4. Still it accounts for dynamics of extracellular compounds S and biomass B and products P. So the steady state equation for intracellular metabolized N dot R equals zero is still valid. We can use that. But what changes in this case is that upper bound of R1. Still we, are make, we want to maximize R5, but R1 is constrained by their kinetics. The upper bound of uptake, of uptake rate is constrained by kinetics and kinetics function of concentration of S in this case. S is in turn a function of a time. Therefore, their upper bounds change in time because environmental condition change, changes. And this linear program is coupled with ordinary differential equation. So for simplicity, I, I, let's say I'm interested in like simulating consumption of S and production biomass. I'm not interested in predicting production of a product P, then I have only two ordinary differential equations, TS over DT. Here, X represents biomass concentration. And to solve this two ordinary differential equation, I have to know what is R1, what is R5. This R1, R5 are determined from linear programming under given constraint. And of course, given time, 
even though this upper bound of R1 changes in time, but if, even time, this is fixed. Therefore, you know, fixed upper bound of R1 and we can solve linear programming, get the R specific flux vector. What I need is R1 and R5 again, and R1 and R5. Then I insert and uh, plug this value into this equation. Then now I'm ready to solve ordinary differential equations. By solving ordinary differential equations, I can provide like what is the next time concentration of substrate S. And this S will be used to update the, the uh, upper bound of uh, uptake rate here. Then this cycle goes on. This is very simple, but fascinating uh, idea and a well, well established algorithm. So more specifically, if you consider the batch reactor, and then here, left hand side, you can see two batch reactors, but it's different time T and T plus delta T. I indicated their concentration change in time with, by different colors. So from blue to light blue. And then this is the uh, workflow that, that you can follow to solve uh, to, to simulation, to simulate the FBA model. Of course, we have to specify what is the initial concentration of a substrate and biomass. Then based on the kinetics, that is the uptake rate of uh, substrate and you can get uptake rate and then use this uptake as a constraint and fit that into LP, FBA as a constraint and then run FBA to predict growth rate or all other flux, fluxes in, in the network. And this output is input to ordinary differential equations. And then you just repeat cycle until that your batch time or reaches the pre-specified pre ending time. So one thing you may notice here is that linear program needs to be performed at every time step, right? That's the source of a computational burden because there are many different types of ODE solvers and Euler, uh, simply Euler explicit model is simple every time we, we integrate one time, but there is an implicit model and then meaning that equations are nonlinear, therefore you have to iteratively simulate until that you have a good convergence every time step and it increases the number of uh, calculation. And therefore this, but not very significantly heavy, but still uh, this is the source of computational burden in performing TFBA for batch simulations. Same for simulating continuous tank reactor. Now I stole a, a figure from uh, Shaibi uh, et al's uh, paper 2009. And then um, as already a uh, team went over this figure, this represents, and this is a, a reactive transport model. And these lines represent their computational uh, grid cells. And then as indicated be below by different colors and then at different times, it has a, a spatial gradients of substrate and biomass, also temporal gradient because that concentration change across time as well. Therefore, we, we cannot use like a homogeneous assumption in this case. We have to solve equations or we have to get the reaction rates for every single grid cell within this computational domain. So, and a very intuitive way to do this is that we, every at given time, and then we get concentration from every uh, grid cell, and then uh, we get like a fluxes as constraints and give that to FBA as an input, FBA runs at linear programming, and then calculate out like a reaction fluxes, all the reaction fluxes and some of the reaction fluxes out of FBA is input to solve this reactable transport model. And now computational head burden even more increases. Previously, there's homogeneous, therefore we just need to repeat the LP every time step, but now every grid, every grid cell, it has different concentration, therefore different uh, fluxes, different flux uh, constraints, right, for FBA. Therefore, the number of LP we need to perform is number of time step times number of grid cells. How many grid cells? It depends on the scale of your problem. And, but usually uh, if you have two dimensional problem, uh, one grid, one uh, coordinate like more than 100 grid cell on other axis. But if you handle large scale problem, it grids, the number of grids really large. Therefore, 
you can imagine how many time, how much time it will it'll take to get like a simulation result. And now, team uh, really, and his team, <laughs> team's team, uh, really uh, developed nice elegant idea how to couple uh, FBA with reactive transport modeling through lookup table. So what is a lookup table? He already mentioned that, but I'll go over it again. So lookup table is like this. Uh, this is three-dimensional simple representation lookup table without having to run FBA every time step, every single grid. We just run FBA over possible uh, range of input fluxes. Then we generate them in advance. And then we make a table and as a store, we store every input fluxes and output reactions as a table. So it's not really two dimensional table, it's a multi-dimensional table, depending on how many fluxes you take as an input, this is an n-dimensional hyper uh, space of table. And now this indirect coupling, then every time step, every single grid, and then you, instead of solving FBA anymore, you go there and then uh, get the flux constraint and search this uh, lookup table C to C or oh, where is the uh, reaction like a biomass uh, cross rate or other production there, where is it? So we can just go in this case, oh, our flux constraints are here and organic uptake and ammonium and oxygen here, then, oh, this point three is the reaction rate they need, need to have as an input to solve these reactive transport equations. And two years later, and then same team, but led by this time, this time, and then uh, they developed an improved algorithm called the direct coupling, and they generate lookup table on the fly in this case. So therefore, first they check whether uh, they get flux constraints every single time, every single uh, grid cell, check whether lookup table get the reaction rate they want to get. If answer is yes, okay, they will use that. And then they just, they don't have to perform FOP. However, if lookup table, because lookup table is not made in this case, in the beginning, just it's generated on the fly. Therefore, initially there is no lookup table. So lookup table will progressively built. Therefore, in many, initially at least, or in many cases, uh, the, the reaction rate they are looking for are not available from lookup table. Therefore, they run FBA and then output of FBA will be given as input to reactive transport models. And this result, because this is, was not part of lookup table, we have to save the result and, and add that result to lookup table. So lookup table initially zero was small, then in progressively increased its size. This is this is my understanding of their direct coupling, FBA and reactive transport modeling. And then when I uh, left the PNN last year, I had a conversation with Tim Shaibi, and then uh, there was consensus between us that uh, about the difficulty or challenge in extending this lookup table approach to more complex problems. And it's very common that one genome scale metabolic network has a couple hundreds uh, exchange reactions. Why I'm talking about exchange reactions? Because that's the reactions they can be used as input for performing linear programming. So FOB, therefore, let's say, so two or too many, like let's say we have a genome scale network and then 100 exchange reactions. Each reaction, exchange re reaction takes up different elements and carbon and nitrogen sources and the cofactors and so forth. And we discretize each exchange duration into 100 degrees. It's, this is not many, 100 is just, just no more. We can increase that 10,000 though. But even with this setting, how many, what is the complex of the lookup table? How many cells exist in the lookup table? Calculation is very simple. 100 to the 100, 10 to the 200 is 200 digits. It's not the number 200, 200 digits. One zero zero, that number of zeros 200. Okay, so then in this case, building a full lookup table is painful process or maybe practically infeasible. Also reading, I mean, accessing a lookup table and reading values and this is also a really sluggish process. 
and it will hurt all overall simulation speed. So that's why that motivated work and then I really inspired by the team's uh, suggestion then I was looking for opportunity to implement this idea. And recently I did. And then, so instead of a lookup table, then I'm, we can use uh, machine learning in this case, net, um, neural data model. Neural data model has the same input and output as lookup table. Input are uh, like any uptake rate of interest, like organic carbon, ammonium, nitrogen, and oxygen. Output is growth rate in this case for simplification, but we can increase the no nodes, output nodes, the input nodes as necessary. Of course, we have, like we had to run FBA several times to build a lookup table. We have, have to run FBA also several times, many times, to use their output as, as a training data set for this neural data. However, the required amount of FBA running is significantly lesser because it doesn't have to be like equal distance of uh, discretization of exchange flux. We can just randomly sample the FBA solution from parameter space and then use them as training data set. And here are some, uh, in the next few slides, I'll give you some simple backgrounds on neural network model, modeling for those who are not very familiar with the machine learning and neural network model. So neural network model like has structure like this. It has an input layer, output layer, in between hidden layers. And there are some vocabularies you need to be familiar with. Input variables are called features or attributes. And the number of layers are called depths. So deep learning network means that it has a multiple, intra, multiple hidden layers inside. And also there's width, width is number of nodes for each layer. So wide network or deeper network. So this is a term they can use. And very simple uh, mathematical component of a uh, machine learning or a neural network model. And so there are three components. It's, I think if you understand this correctly, you can make a neural network model yourself. First, linear mapping. So then you, are, you have a variables in input layer and you take here, uh, as indicated by shaded yellow area here, this is a weighted summation of input variables from the previous node. So then the node values in the current node is determined by the uh, weighted summation of the node values in the previous layer. This simple mass is just, made, just a weighting factor here of Ws needs to be determined, the parameter to be determined. But this is simple linear mapping doesn't work. It's not really effective for developing accurate neural network models. So we need more. Second component is a bias. Bias simply that additional nodes, it's called, nodes is called the neurons, by the way. And then you add additional constant term to the, uh, this communication obtained from a linear mapping. So by adding constant, this is not linear equations anymore. It doesn't satisfy superposition principle. Therefore, it's not linear. It's called affine system, though. Anyway, finally, then now it's not a little, little bit uh, went away from linear system, but the primary source for nonlinearity is activation function. There's a component three. So you add here activation function, and then the output here in this case S1. S2, so forth, SK, it's not our final output. Final output should be, it will be obtained to go by going through this activation function. So this is like a binary, for example, uh, classification. So if output is negative, then zero, the final output is zero, and the positive is one, something like that. But most frequently used is the sigmoid function before, but now people have tested the different types of uh, activation function that the for deep learning, many people think that Lilu is a very weird shape. It is uh, piecewise differentiable, not uh, fully differentiable, but this Lilu really powerfully working well for improving the accuracy of the natural model. Okay, with that, uh, this is a real application of neural network now. And I used our PNNL SBL team's metagenome data and uh, collected from north and south. This is for demonstration, I'm showing only the results from NURS. This is a less vegetative area. Using K-base, I developed, so not 
when I say I, it's not me. So actually our teams have built less and helped to develop this network. And then I hacked that uh, network and then ran FVA and not too many, like just thousand times FVA. And, but here, this is an example of, actually this is graphical representation of a lookup table. It's, for simplification, I just chose only two in input fluxes that can be used as constraints. So this is a glucose uptake rate of fluxes. Look at the unit. It's minimal per gram drive per hour, and then ammonium uptake flux, also same unit. And then look at this. They are piecewise like a plane. Uh, it's not really highly nonlinear. It's nonlinear though, but highly non not highly nonlinear. But there are some uh, linearity you can see there. That's why I think machine learning or neural network really working well. So if you really high, highly nonlinear uh, relationship between input and output, so we have to use like all the best network modeling or machine learning technique to accurately predict this relationship. But in this case, it was very easy. I was surprisingly, it was very surprisingly easy to build the neural network model. Anyway, nevertheless, you can see the two different zone here. Here, there you can see, oh, this is light nitrogen limited condition. So when nitrogen concentration is here, then you can see the relationship between glucose uptake and nitrogen uptake biomass is like that, governed by this plane. But here, another second zone here is a carbon limited condition, different equation works for you know, describing their relationship. So I'm, I'm a MATLAB guy, I'm, I'm most frequently uh, using MATLAB instead of Python. But in, in my age, it's difficult to switch over to different tool. But once you're familiar with one tool, one, one language, I think if you're young, if you're intelligent, you can be easily switch over to another uh, language, but I'm not. Anyway, so the particularly MATLAB GUI was powerfully working well. So NN start is a neural net start and you will have a first uh, main menu. You can choose different application or neural network feeding, data feeding or pattern recognition or clustering what modeling time series data, this is very interesting. So using recursive uh, neural network, for example. And this is actual training of neural network using one hidden layer as 10 nodes. And then I input uh, work, glucose uptake and ammonia uptake output was biomass. And this is an error, decreasing error as iteration goes on is number of epochs. You can take this as an iteration. And error significantly decreases at first few iterations and then slowly decreasing after that. And then, so we usually divide the data into three groups, like training group, uh, data for training, data for validation. These two groups together are called the training data sets actually. And then also we set aside the different data sets as test data set. This data should not be used anywhere, anytime for training or for determining this uh, network parameters or uh, hyperparameter optimization, so-called. Now you can see the output is really uh, surprisingly accurate because uh, as target is output variable with biomass production from FOBA, and this is a prediction, prediction from neural network model. Of course, it's training data set, therefore it should be accurate. Validation is also accurate, almost one. Test data set is also correlation is perfectly one. And altogether, of course, one. Now I applied this neural network trained from FBA, like sampled FBA data, and then to simulate a batch reactor. And then I considered two cases. One is a carbon limited condition and nitrogen limited condition. And this solid line represents the FBA calculation, rigorous FBA calculation, and the circle is output from neural trained neural network. So this to, to realize carbon limited condition uh, with this, uh, I have chosen carbon limited condition concentration based on the, the three-dimensional uh, lookup table I have shown to you in the previous slide. And then I chose that and then see glucose and nitrogen, they are uh, consuming together. And when gluc glucose is depleted, cell could not grow, means that ammonium is not depleted but could not be used anymore because cell cannot grow anymore. This is carbon limited, that's why. And nitrogen limited, we start from lower concentration ammonium Therefore, ammonium is depleted earlier than glucose. Therefore, after that, interesting is this model still 
showing the biomass products. I checked with it. I, I never paid attention to that. Sorry about that. But interestingly, this is uh, uh, also not only the output from neural network, but also from uh, FBA. But I checked with that. Probably others, carbon, nitrogen sources are using for that. Anyway, so now I talk about neural, the use of neural network for reactive transport model. There are three ways actually. One, as a basic as a basic idea, we can replace replace FBA calculation with neural network. This corresponds to replacement source term reaction rates in reactive transport model. Second, we can replace reactive transport model itself with neural network meaning the replacement par partial differential equations itself. How we can generate uh, data by simulating reactive transport models and then use those data to train neural network model. So the approach is that we use the neural numerical approach method. I think Tim has like to talk about this, but there are, so the most commonly used method for solving partial differential equations is the method of lines, meaning that we discretize all the derivative, derivative terms into algebraic equations, except only one variable, in this case, time derivative. Therefore, using the method of lines, we can convert partial differential equations that contains derivative, time derivative and special derivative into ordinary, a set of ordinary differential equations by converting special derivative terms into a set of algebraic equations. Therefore, but typically, we use a finite different method, finite volume, finite element, and boundary element. However, we also it is possible to use neural network model because neural network model is an algebraic relationship between input and output. We can just put there and then com to convert. You know, you can derivate, take a derivative over uh, derivative with respect to variables for these uh, algebraic equations. You will get like algebraic equations as outcome. Anyway, but I'm not covering this. I have not, I have not tested this third idea. I just focus first two ideas in this talk. And I made a one D column model. This is not really a rigorous one D column model like Kawai did, but this is a simple configuration. I considered only two components of glucose and ammonium, and as indicated by color gradient along the axis, there's one dimensional spatial gradient, and then also temporal gradient as well. And then we'll get unreacted glucose and ammonium at the outlet. And then again, the solid line from FBA simulation and in reactive transport model, and the circle neural network model in RTM. And initially, the their concentration of glucose was zero, but as time goes on, and then it builds up the non-zero concentration of glucose, and then ammonium and biomass growing, and then this delta t is of 0.2 hours. I I don't see any errors in between two cases here again. And then the simulation time, ah, I forgot to mention that in the batch simulation, the simulation time was two, more than 200 times faster. But in this, in this 1D column simulation, it was more than 350 times. It depends on how many degrees you consider in this model. I will, I, if I remember correctly, it's 50 to 100 degrees, but if you, if I consider 1,000 grid size, like, then the, difference between FBA and neural network model in RTM will be significantly more. And now, second idea, whether we can replace reactive model, reactive transport model itself, whether we can replace partial differential equations with neural network model. So for, for this, I need to specify what I'm, I'm going to predict using neural network model. The target variable, I'm going to predict is concentration change in time at the outlet. So temporal change here of a product concentration at the outlet. This is a target variable I wanna predict using neural network model. To determine this temporal change of a product concentration at the outlet, there are several variables we need to specify. In real 1D column experimental system, we have to know what is the inlet concentration of cool carbon and nitrogen sources. Second, what are the flow conditions like velocity, and also parameters that are affect velocity and then resonance time, like dispersion coefficient, porosity, permeability, geometry, etc. And but in order to train the model, and I'm not using these uh, parameters there, so except velocity. 
or not nafilas tero. So actually, the, I I have taken three input parameters, okay, features to train neural network model in this case. There is inlet concentration glucose, same as this, and inlet concentration ammonium here. But instead of this, a bunch of parameters that affect flow conditions, I have taken the resistance time distribution as a new feature for training the network. So velocity, dispersion coefficient, porosity, permeability, they will all affect their resistance time distribution. This is like how long the particle, inert particle will reside or stay inside the column, lip, inside 1D column. That's the definition of uh, resistance time distribution. Then this is my simulation of a resonance time distribution is cumulative way. So cumulative time, cumulative resonance time distribution, and then by changing velocity, and this in this case, I have just only two parameters. Dispersion coefficient that ch changes from zero to two meters square and per hour and velocity with zero to two meter per hour. This is a really wide range of variables. And then I randomly pick up uh, this variable and then simulate so-called cold flow simulation because there is no reaction. This is enough. Without reaction, I just simulate just reaction to get this uh, cumulative resistance time distribution. And this is a testing. Like this is a new data that I never used for training network. For example, I have chosen 64 millimole uh, per liter glucose in the feed, and then 48, 5.6 millimole per liter for ammonium. And this is specific case of resistance time distribution. Then this is output. A uh, temporal change of concentration uh, as like, like a glucose and ammonium unreacted uh, substrates. Initially, there's no unreacted because there, in the in the react uh, one D column there is no ammonium concentration. But as time goes on and it develops certain non uh, non zero profile here, again this solid line is uh, solving rigorous reactive transfer model and then uh, this neural network model. This is cool. I don't see any errors uh, out of this either. However, I have to confess that I used a trick in doing this. Actually, I'm, I have not used one giant, one master neural network for pitting or predicting this. Actually, I had to use sub neural networks for each time zone. So for example, the two predict response uh, at the outlet from this first time zone I had to develop first sub neural network, second neural network, and third neural network, and then I combine them. Well, that, that is not really cool, but I found that in recent paper, this composite with this order modeling approach is not really rare. It's common or it's becoming available. So for example, this paper, Chen et al. in 2020 paper, they also used like machine learning techniques, multivariate uh, analysis models, for uh, for reduced order modeling, this is a carbon CO2 uh, injection rate for CO2 sequestration, and x axis is real data and y axis their uh, reduced order model prediction. But this is a result when they use one uh, reduced order model. But if you look at the right hand side, it's a log log scale. There is data is dispersed when this uh, range of uh, CO2 injection rate is small. This is strikingly similar to my situation. So therefore, what they did is that they divided this injection CO2 rate into subdivision and developed four different sub-reduced order models and finally combined them like that. So they called it, this is a Frankenstein's Ramster model. Ram represent reduced order modeling, similar to like a Frankenstein's monster Ramster. It's fun. All right, so this is summary slide, and I talked about machine learning for more scalable BGC and reactive transport modeling. And then I, I showed how I can build a reactive transport, the, the neural network model based on FBA simulation and the, to replace the reaction rate terms in reactive transport model. Or even I can replace the people, the, not people, the reactive transport model itself based on uh, reaction, based on boundary conditions, and then the resistance time distribution to predict the outputs. Or in this case, I, I think I had to use a set of sub reduced order models, but in the future, I'm going to test, what if I test a more 
deeper neural network. Deeper neural network has more, uh, many more internal hidden layers and many more also wider network. There's some more nodes per layer. This may may improve the prediction accuracy. So finally, this is my final slide. And then we previously provide a workflow for incorporating metagenomes and all the way to develop a reactive transport model. The challenging part was here, as, as boxed here, how to link this uh, flux balance analysis to biochemical reaction and reactive transport model. But the work I have presented today is really open a new possibility to enable and seamlessly connect FBA and, uh, and then reactive transport model and biochemical model. This workflow, we name it the magic metagenome map integration into ecosystem models. All right, uh, that's it. Uh, do we have time for questions? Sorry, I'm getting my getting unmuted here. Hyun, that was just wonderful. And there are lots of questions, um, both uh, in Discord, which you might need to address, um, you know, during the break or something. But there were a few questions uh, coming up on the on the chat here, and. Um, Here's a question. For generating the training data set for the neural network, it should be required to do this only once for a particular organism or a specific community composition. So can you address that? And then there's more. <laughs> um, it depends on how uh, modelers want to formulate the model. If the modeler wants to develop one supraorganismal network and then uh, I think still, uh, uh, I think compositional information will be helpful to train the network better. I think in either case, I thought initially I thought okay, the compositional information important only for we develop species level interactions, but both cases they are useful. But so in this case, I assume that really that we have only one network. But if you want to look at uh, predicted interactions, species interactions, and their, their compositional effect on biochemistry, I think you better add the compositional data as input as well. Okay, that sounds great. And what is the time effort required to um, train the data set? It's surprisingly short. I, so we are currently in a stage that we can use KBase for training um, neural network model. I train neural network myself on using MATLAB. It was very short, I just uh, minutes. Believe it or not, minutes, but KBase, it was short. June have to test that. Also, it was very short. Okay, and so do you just do that once or do you need to train it multiple times? Is it like a good question? But yeah, also I have to modify my answer because it was a short because my case was considering only two inputs and then one output. But if I expand the inputs and outputs, it'll take more. But okay. training is not necessarily bottleneck. And then multiple, yeah, if the problem is complicated and data uh, complexity increases, sometimes we just train oneself and then followed by fine tuning to do hyper optimization. It's like uh, there are some step by step approaches for improving uh, accuracy. There were, there were some questions. I mean, every, I think everybody is completely enthral enthralled by this concept, this magic. Uh, concept. And so there are a lot of requests for, you know, literature, um, any references that you might have um, that uh, that you think are key for pursuing this or that you're in the process of developing. Right. So this is a, one of the, our focus manuscript papers we are preparing. Uh, uh, this is not available as a paper yet, but we started uh, outlining paper and then through publication, we'll share everything uh, in, with public users. And But at the moment, just uh, know the concept is available and tools are all required, the competition tools are developed. And then the remaining things that we just put them together as our entire one pipeline and workflow. That'll be coming soon. So, so is there any existing papers that really connect the neural networks either to the, um, the flux flux balance analysis or to reactive transport modeling or? Uh, I don't know. Prob I, this was very easy. I, I think there might be some work or uh, papers on 
uh, training uh, neural network for FP, but I don't know whether this method has been used for coupling with reactive transport models. Okay. So, so <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is what's really exciting, uh, you know, about the developments and your willingness to share them, um, you know, in this, this school. It's just so exciting. Um, so here's a question. Uh, how many observations, field and laboratory, will be needed to build a decent model? I know it might uh, depend on the application, but maybe a range. I, I don't know that I completely understand the yeah. context. So I need to clarify whether uh, the question really is about data-driven modeling, like a neural network model or the mechanistic model, but uh, is usually this data-driven modeling or machine learning requires significant amount of data for training. There's a one issue in using uh, machine learning techniques, but one way we can do is that we uh, train mechanistic model first using limited experimental data. But you know that how many data is required for training and not training, determining or uh, developing mechanistic models. And then we run the mechanistic model to generate significantly large number of data. That simulated data can be used for machine learning then. Then mm -hmm. it's an alternative way, but this is uh, uh, worth doing. Well, that's great. Um, I guess we can hang out here, see if there are more uh, questions coming in. Can I ask a quick question, Nancy? I was, I was going to ask Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. I was going to ask Ken um, about your thoughts on these kind of applications and maybe future apps in KBase. Is there any plans there or any way to connect this to KBase? Yes, uh, that's a good question. We really aimed at demonstrating this pipeline like machine learning components as well through KBase. But so actually we are currently at a stage that we can uh, generate import data into KBase space narrative and train neural network model using Python library that you uh, installed. And we can, that training process is easily done. However, we have to save the output file in KBase. To save output file, we have to define objects. It's objects the format of input and output files. We are not allowed to define output file ourselves. Therefore, we have to, because once it is defined, that it, it, it will be used for many other users. Therefore, we have to be, have a, enough discussion with the KBase team. I think with that, with overcoming those barriers, then I think that it will be soon available for implementation in KBase as well. Ken, here's a, another question, which is really kind of interesting um, uh, from Allison Toon. I'm thinking, if I'm thinking of this correctly, neural networks aren't solving a set of physical conservation equations necessarily. So are neural network models conservative with respect to mass or energy? Or does careful training of the neural network take care of that? Uh, yeah, that is an interesting question, really. And Mechanistic model really uh, guarantee, I mean, good Mechanistic model guarantee that mass and energy are balanced out. However, this is approximation. This is data-driven fitting and uh, tuning. Therefore, not rigorously satisfied, but it's reasonably well satisfied if we develop well this neural network model. So is this just different than like um, physics constrained uh, machine learning or, you know, uh, chemistry informed or does it, yeah, sorry. Uh, I think physical constraints can be, I, I'm not very familiar with that concept. Um, so what, so everything should be accounted, I think, as input at the feature and then target. Right. Therefore, uh, we can account for physical constraint through features and then uh, output variable. Therefore, uh, indirectly, we can account for that. But still, uh, rigorous uh, mass balances may not be uh, observed from this day. But error might be small, though, if we develop good models reasonably well. But it's, there is a so there's a, a lot of way to synergistically combine mechanistic models 
and the data driven modeling in this sense.